The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 8387 in the name of Gordon Lyndhurst on Barclay Review recommendations and the sport and leisure sector. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I can ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Gordon Lyndhurst to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Lyndhurst. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm pleased to bring this debate to Parliament today uh, on the important issue of the unimplemented aspects of the Barclay Review, and I'd like to welcome all those who have come to hear the debate, including some councillors. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, in spite of my persistent questioning, has not yet said whether the government is committed to the unimplemented aspects or not. Eventually, he will, of course, have to nail his colours to the mast. This is an opportunity for all of us, however, to reflect on this debate before that decision is taken. And having spoken to a variety of those organizations liable to be affected, some of them at least do not appear to have had opportunity to make their case to the Barclay Review itself. The recommendations came as a surprise and in some cases a shock to them. Perhaps the government didn't see this coming either. Awareness of the potential consequences is, however, now spreading, even as the debate unfolds. Different areas of Scotland will have different stories to tell, including my own Lothian region. So let us begin by reminding ourselves that the Scottish Conservatives, as indeed the Cabinet Secretary is aware, supported a number of the recommendations of Barclay, uh, which have since been adopted by the government. The remainder still sit in the Cabinet Secretary's in-tray, including one to remove charitable rates relief from private schools. That and other aspects are equally important, but today our focus is on Barclay recommendations 24 and 27. Now, recommendation... Uh, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Gordon Lindhurst for taking the intervention. Just since um, the member has touched on the point, uh, can the member identify any of the revenue-raising recommendations that the Conservatives do support? Mr Lindhurst. We, we will return to that at the appropriate point of time. <laughs> Of course, as I've said, <laughs> tonight we are not looking at other aspects of the Barclay Review or the unimplemented uh, parts of the report, but specifically items 24 and 27. And we should, uh, no, not on this occasion. So we should focus on that rather than being deflected by questions about other matters tonight. Recommendation 24 says that charity relief should be reformed and restricted for a small number of recipients and that arm's length external organisations or alios, such as Edinburgh Leisure or Excite and West Lothian should lose their charitable relief. Recommendation 27 says that sports club relief should be reviewed to remove relief from unintended recipients with, quote, significant assets. Now, at the heart of both of these recommendations lies a fundamental misunderstanding of what the organizations affected actually provide and how they are structured. Furthermore, recommendation 24 describes local councils and the alios they have established to deliver services on their behalf as being engaged in an exercise in tax avoidance. Now, the very use of the words tax avoidance is frankly ridiculous if we consider what services alios deliver. <coughs> and Barclay claims that creation of these alios has led to unfair competition between the public and private sectors. But we cannot and should not equate alios with the private sector. Both have their place and part to play, of course. But ALIOs, as not-for-profit organizations, deliver services to many parts of the community that, if delivered on a standalone basis, would not be financially viable. Put it simply, it wouldn't happen. It is therefore logical that ALIOs, such as Edinburgh Leisure and Excite, are registered charities approved by the Scottish Charities Regulator, OSCAR. That is because they provide public benefit Edinburgh Leisure, for example, offers services such as the Healthy Active Minds Project, which uses physical activity to help people improve their mental well-being. Now, there are 
many examples of what they and other charitable organizations provide for the public good, including delivery of affordable sport and leisure activities for disadvantaged families or disabled people. And indeed, many users are referred to these facilities by their own GPs. As one user of Edinburgh Leisure Facilities said to me with enthusiasm, Edinburgh Leisure has changed my life. That is a real comment to illustrate a real issue. Turning to recommendation 27, no, it may be valid to raise the question as to whether sports club relief could be more focused. But the recommendation is vague when it says that clubs with significant assets should lose sports relief. Who does that cover? I visited a community sports club in my region which has one significant asset, a sports center paid for through funding and loans. The club provides discounted sport and leisure to a disadvantaged neighborhood. It has taken over responsibility of some infrastructure from the local authority and it makes available sports pitches to local state schools free of charge, but it runs in a fairly tight budget. If the recommendation is adopted, it may not survive, and the pitches in surrounding area could again become derelict and fall into disuse. This illustrates what may happen if these recommendations are taken forward, with the addition of millions of pounds of business rates bills onto such organizations. 92% of trusts responding to a recent survey said some leisure centres and swimming pools would close. Many would at the very least need to increase their charges and drop activities currently provided to local communities at little or no cost. I've spoken to those who would be affected and these are the very real consequences they face. Ironically, 45 million pounds of savings in recommendation 24 could be lost entirely. If rateable properties close, the non-domestic tax take shrinks and costs rise in other areas such as the NHS, social work, or for the police services. All of this would surely fly in the face of the Scottish Government's own national outcomes and programme for government priorities for getting and keeping more Scots active for life. With two-thirds of adults now overweight or obese, there's unlikely to be improvement if sports facilities close or become more expensive. Deputy Presiding Officer, my speech today merely scratches the surface of these specific issues which we are discussing tonight, not other issues such as the CABSEC wanted to go into. There's much more to be said, but my time is up and I leave that to others. I simply conclude by saying that I sincerely hope the Cabinet Secretary and Government will reflect very carefully indeed on the potentially devastating consequences of taking on these particular recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lindhurst. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd, I'd like to uh, give thanks for, to, to Gordon Lindhurst for bringing forward this debate. And indeed, I'd need to begin by uh, declaring my interest. I am a director of a, a company with uh, retail interests in the West End of Edinburgh. Um, and indeed, that gives me a, a little bit of inside knowledge uh, and indeed experience of the rate system and what rates reviews do. And I think it's fair to say that the rates regime is pretty widely reviled by the business community because it's inconsistent, opaque, arbitrary, irregular, and it's a, frankly a growing proportion of uh, retail's business cost base. The uh, Scottish Retail Consortium estimate that over the last decade it's uh, increased by almost a half. So indeed we welcomed um, the uh, intention to look again at business rates. We welcomed the Barclay Review. But I have to say, it frankly did not go far enough. In terms of that list I just gave, I think pretty much only the second last one it really fully addressed in any serious way indeed, a way, a way at all. We also welcome some of the details we have already had. I, I welcome the fact that nurseries are being lifted out of business rates. And I'll let the minister give me credit or not for that one. Um, but, but the fundamentals are still the same. Rateable values are still calculated by the assessor in an opaque way, carried out by different assessors in different areas by different ways. There is no audit of that. And frankly, I had a pretty shocking meeting with the local assessor here. When, and when I asked, who checks your calculation? Who checks what you're doing? Whether you're, you're applying the data, the information from the data you collect accurately to calculate people's bills, they said no one. We informally check it with other assessors. This is a system which is opaque. It's, it's uh, inconsistent. 
and frankly leads to unfair results. Results which have put uh, many businesses uh, uh, in my constituencies out of business because they've gone from having no rates uh, to pay and because of the change in rateable value, suddenly having a huge monthly bill to pay. So such as uh, businesses such as uh, Babies and Bumps in my constituencies, which are a well-loved cafe, and there are others which are facing hardship because of those changes. But tonight's debate is primarily about sports clubs and alios. And indeed, in my constituency, two such sports clubs are being potentially impacted by this possible change to their, their uh, uh, rates bills. Carlton Cricket Club and Inch Park Community Sports Club. Now, I hope Carlton Cr Cricket Club barely needs an introduction. It is the home of Scottish cricket, cricket being the fastest growing sport in Scotland. And yet they have the uncertainty of the potential increase in their rates bill. Inch Park Community Sports Club, a club founded out of community asset transfer where well over 2,000 people are regularly taking part in sport, one which is committed to reaching out to marginalised groups who are saying to me they frankly can't plan for their future because they don't know what their cost base is going to be. But what we do know is that it's under review, that, that there is, this is going to be looked at by the Minister. But I have consistently asked for clarification as to what form this review is going to take, when we'll have an answer, and I've twice had a response. First one was saying, well, further consideration to this engagement will be given by the government, and then pushing further that stakeholder engagement will take place. The bottom line of that is that we have no details, no timescale, and no deadline. And to the wider point about Elios, I think the, point, uh, the, the, the points that Gordon Lindhurst are well made. I know very well how well used the facilities of Edinburgh Leisure are. They are, provide access to sports facilities to a great number of people in our community. And we have to ask the question of this. This policy has the potential to undermine what is meant to be of something of fundamental importance to the government, the healthy well-being of our citizens, helping people participate in sport, improving their health. And frankly, this just puts this at risk. End the uncertainty now. Clarify these sports clubs' positions. Let's not have them paying any more money than they have to. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Murdo Fraser, followed by John Mason. Mr Fraser, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by congratulating Gordon Linter for securing this debate on what is an important subject. How we raise money for our public services is a conversation this Parliament is finally having. And there are a range of opinions uh, from across the Chamber. But I think we could all agree that taxation must be fair and proportionate. And the recently released Paradise Papers have reignited the public debate around who does and doesn't pay their fair share. Just as thought-provoking was last year's business rates revaluation, which Mr Johnson has just referred to, and I heard from many local businesses in my area who felt unfairly targeted by some of the increases that that led to. From these discussions, it was clear that the current system uh, was failing and fundamental reform was needed. And the Barclay Review was a comprehensive summary of the uh, issues and made some sensible recommendations, as Gordon Lindhurst said, although, of course, it was hamstrung from the very start uh, by the requirement on the part of the Finance Secretary that any proposals had to be revenue neutral. But one proposal not so sensible was the call to tax allios. If implemented, this would have a negative impact on local facilities across the country. What the Barclay Review does is it characterises allios as tax avoidance structures. And therefore, according to this review, your local leisure centre can be treated as equivalent to the likes of the high-profile celebrities we hear about who have offshore accounts to avoid UK tax. This is absolute nonsense, Deputy Presiding Officer. There is no equivalence between an offshore shell company and your local swimming pool. And the failure to see this on the part of the Scottish Government would be unforgivable. Now, in my own electoral area, Perth and Kinross Council have Live Active running the region's sport and leisure facilities. This is no Mossack Fonseca type operation. The trust was one of the longest serving in the UK and was set up over 50 years ago to develop and provide sporting and leisure facilities in the area. The model is a simple one. Any profits from the gyms and swimming pools is channeled back into loss-making social programmes. Perth Live Active's work is truly transformational. Despite the clear social benefits delivered by Live Active, they would be targeted by the Barclay Review proposals. They would be hit with an annual tax bill of £1 million if their relief, relief was removed. Now, according to a letter uh, sent to the Finance Secretary by Live Active's chairman, Mike Robinson, the impact of this would be devastating. 
with increased admission charges, reduced social programming and the potential closure of loss-making facilities. If the Scottish Government are serious about tackling the obesity time bomb, then hiking taxes on sports facilities is not the way to achieve it. What Live Active does is it offers free swimming lessons for vulnerable children, it teaches disabled kids to cycle, it provides walking groups for the elderly, it provides respite for carers, free sporting access for disadvantaged families, and bonding classes for new parents. In what world does this sound like an organisation ripe for additional taxation? Now, despite the obvious social good that Live Active provides, here we have a finance secretary still considering taxing these projects out of existence. And we have a very similar issue in another part of my region, in Stirling, with the Alio Stirling Leisure. In their case, they estimate the additional cost to them as being £600,000 per annum. Today, Andrew Bain, the chief executive, told me that, and I quote, the local consequences could be catastrophic. Bertha Fraser is just concluding. <laughs> oh. Well, I, now I, he knows I'm he is. Terribly sorry uh, to my, uh, my good friend. I cannot give way to him on this occasion. But let me just say, in, in concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, the SNP's swim tax, because that's what it is, must be avoided at all costs. And I'd call upon the, the Cabinet Secretary to come and visit Live Active in Perth before he thinks about saddling them with a £1 million annual tax bill. If Scotland is to reduce obesity, if we're going to encourage activity and salvage any kind of legacy from Andy Murray and the Commonwealth Games, then the SNP need to axe this tax. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Mason to be followed by Maurice Golden. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very happy to speak in this debate and thank Gordon Lindhurst for bringing it. I think it's worth remembering the background to the Barclay Review because there was a widespread acceptance that the NDR non-domestic rate system could be improved, especially if that could encourage economic growth. However, there was certainly not an acceptance that there should be an overall reduction in NDR. Reducing business rates as a whole would almost inevitably mean a less skilled workforce and a less healthy workforce because we would have to make cuts elsewhere and that would damage the economy. Now, there's a whole range of issues raised by this motion, but I would like to particularly concentrate on three. First of all, what is a charity? My understanding of a traditional charity was an organisation like Oxfam, Cancer Research or a hospice, which would be largely funded by donations, largely run by volunteers and would have the aim of helping vulnerable folk or even animals here or overseas. An ALIO, arm's length external organisation like Glasgow Life, would not be a traditional charity. So I think there is a wider issue as to whether we need a review of what is and what is not a charity. SCVO, the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, suggests that allowing local government bodies to be treated as charities can put pressure on real charities. Therefore, rates relief for charities would not have applied. What is effectively an arm of Glasgow City Council, it seems to me that the letter of the law has been adhered to, but we have drifted away from the spirit of the law, and at some point we need to re-examine what a charity is. My second point would be around the question of public money recirculating. Glasgow Life was set up as an alio while I was a councillor, and I refused to take a seat on the board. It was set up to save on rates, and I was opposed to it. Firstly, because it was inevitably less democratic. Previously, Glasgow City Council had a culture and sport committee. The public could approach their councillors on issues, and the councillors were answerable on that. But Glasgow Life effectively stopped that. Alios are not accountable. I do I have extra time? Uh, briefly, Mr Finlay. I wonder if the member shared uh, his concerns about democracy with the set up of Police Scotland and uh, centralising the fire service. Mr Mason. I think that's a bit away from the debate. Uh, the, the, rate saving, the, also, the rate saving that Glasgow was proposing to make and did make was effectively robbing Peter to pay Paul. Saving the public purse in Glasgow but costing the public purse in Scotland. There is no new actual money in the public sector as a result of uh, these devices. And the reverse is still the case. If a council does start having to pay rates, the money stays in the public purse. It is a zero-sum game. I note that SCVO used the term tax avoidance, and I would not go as far as saying it was immoral, but it does put councils who have refused to use an alio out of principle 
at a disadvantage. Thirdly, uh, my third point would be income has to equal expenditure. The Conservatives told us that they wanted business to pay less rates. But if one organisation pays less rates, another has to pay more. Are the Conservatives now saying that Alios should not pay, but they are happy for other businesses to pay more? Of course, alternatively, expenditure somewhere else could be cut. Would the Conservatives want to cut health or education? Would they want to reduce the number of nurses or school teachers? Then, of course, we could raise income tax to compensate. Maybe the Conservatives are wanting that. But no, the Conservatives want to cut income tax by £140 million. So all in all, I think there's a lack of reality here. To say we should reduce income tax and reduce business rates and increase expenditure in various areas, that is neither good accountancy nor is it good economics. So overall, I am pleased that the Scottish Government has agreed to give further consideration to this whole question, and as, as I understand it, they are still considering. Of course, we want as many people as possible active in sport and other leisure facilities, and we want publicly and volunteer-operated community facilities as much as possible. But I believe we must create a fairer playing field for all organisations and not allow artificial devices like Alios to cloud the picture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call Morris Golden to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Mr Golden, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As my colleagues have mentioned, there is much to welcome in the Barclay Review, but also proposals that need to be challenged. A particularly troubling aspect is the lack of common sense in the proposed changes to charitable relief that would see crucial community services burdened with increased business rates. We all know the challenges we face, encouraging active lifestyles, improving mental health and reducing social isolation. Take sport, for example, it can help with so many of these issues. The vast majority of community sports clubs don't own their own facilities, relying on local leisure trusts. Given that local authorities account for around 90% of sport investment, leisure trusts are a major part of Scotland's sporting landscape. The proposed changes would risk that and in turn risk local clubs. Where is the sense in that? There is none. It's not just sport. In the west of Scotland, Paisley is competing for the title of UK City of Culture. Yet these proposals risk an estimated 1.6 million to local finances. This is a real concern to the community at this critical time for Paisley. The fabric of our local communities is at risk. We need a comprehensive overhaul that supports businesses, charities and clubs who grow our economy, teach our children and improve our well-being. Let's stop the swim tax before it harms our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Golden. I call Andy Whiteman to follow by Tavish Scott. Mr. Whiteman, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank Gordon Lindhurst uh, for bringing this important debate. But before turning to the substance of his motion, I want to put this in some context. Um, I've long been a critic of the non-domestic rating uh, scheme. Uh, for too long, we've had ad hoc, itsy bitsy changes. Some of these changes were hardwired by vested interests some years ago, including the agricultural relief uh, and, most, and, and more recent uh, various reliefs, including charitable and sports clubs, uh, have, in, have been introduced. I particularly welcome this debate because it's an opportunity to subject the non-domestic rating system to some scrutiny, which it generally does not because changes come through secondary legislation under the Local Government Finance Act of 1982. And I, or 92, I don't specifically recall. Um, and I was particularly exercised by the fact that the second biggest tax raised in this place, uh, the non-domestic rates, which I think yielded last year 2.8 billion, is uh, um, uh, facilitated by a statutory instrument, uh, which I attempted to annul uh, last year, just to get some uh, debate. Now, in September 23, the then Finance Secretary, Derek Mc he wasn't the finance secretary, he was the local government minister, I think, at the time. Uh, he uh, uh, did a consultation on non-domestic rates. And in their document, he said, in his introduction, he says, Scottish government is committed to using the period until the next revaluation in 2017 to conduct a thorough and comprehensive review of the whole business rate system. 
all reforms to be in place by next revaluation in 2017, delivering, he said, a fairer, simpler and more efficient business rate system. Presiding officer, that review never took place. Instead, we had the Barclay Review. The Barclay Review asked one question in its consultation. It asked, how would you redesign the business rate system to better support business and incentivize investment? Now, that is a legitimate question to ask, but it is not a comprehensive and thorough review of the non-domestic rating system. It didn't ask any questions on who sets the rates, whether local government be given back control of this important part of their tax base, or many other wider aspects of the system. Barclay was also told that their recommendations should be revenue neutral. And that meant, in practice, that any proposals brought forward to reduce liabilities in any sector had to be balanced by other measures that would make up for this lost yield. So it's in this context, a very narrowly drawn remit, and they need to balance uh, revenue. It's within this context that the proposed subject of Gordon Linter's motion should be considered. These reviews, this particular one to uh, charitable relief for sports facilities, has not been generated by a considered and diligent review as anticipated in 2013, or even as a, as a consequence of a considered review of charitable uh, relief. It's a measure that has been considered very, very cursorily in order to make up a deficit in proposals which had to be revenue neutral. And given that context, I've read views of Sport of Scotland and Edinburgh Leisure very carefully, and as someone who's long been critical of the non-domestic rating system and who wants a thorough review, I do not believe that this is the right context to even be discussing this issue. The potential impact of this proposal is potentially extremely complex and should be considered extremely uh, carefully. It's certainly not as a quick measure to raise some revenue in a budget that's just a month uh, off. Presiding officer, I've long argued that charitable relief, as with small business bonus scheme, is too blunt a relief and doesn't discriminate effectively between a wide range of charities and small businesses. I hope we get to the thorough and comprehensive review promised in 2013, but in conclusion, I am not persuaded that this recommendation by Barclay is well-founded, and I would have very serious reservations voting for any statutory instrument that introduced the reforms noted in Gordon Linter's motion. Thank you. I call Tavish Scott to be followed by Liam Kerr. Mr Scott, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Gordon Lindhurst for allowing Parliament to debate rates relief for sports facilities uh, in the run-up to the Scottish Budget. And I'd also like to thank Derek Mackay as the Cabinet Secretary for uh, taking these debates. I remember what it's like to be a Cabinet Secretary taking debates at five o'clock when everyone else had gone back to their, I was about to say the bar there, but to, the, to their offices to work hard. So uh, I think it is... Uh, uh, quite important that, uh, uh, that uh, Mr Mackay is here. I must confess I disagreed with uh, Murdo Fraser to some extent. I did not find rates revaluation quite as exciting as the Paradise Papers, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Murdo Fraser maybe just needs to get out a bit more. Um, this week, uh, presiding officer, uh, I, I met the uh, Shetland Recreational Trust General Manager, James Johnson, uh, in Lerwick on uh, Monday. And as I was waiting to go into his office, uh, in one of the... Um, spaces within the Clickamin Leisure Centre, an exercise class for older people was taking place. James explained to me that that was done in conjunction with the National Health Service. It was about fitness, mental well-being, companionship, and yes, indeed, fun as well. Uh, the SRT manage leisure centres and swimming pools in Lerwick and across the outlying areas of Shetland. They provide a range of facilities, classes and services for the general public, for pupils and schools, and indeed for specific groups with particular health needs. The SRT with Shetland Immunity Trust and Shetland Arts work across health, well-being, sport, art, culture, the creative industries, heritage and tourism. They deliver on the Scottish Government's approach to mental health, to obesity, to healthy living and so many more policy areas. The Barclay Review proposes removing these organisations' rates relief. Barclay and Government Ministers say such facilities compete with the private sector. Now, that is just simply not the case in Shetland. There are no such private sector alternatives. Are, that argument does not apply to Shetland, nor, I suspect, to many parts of island and rural Scotland. Neither are these bodies allios. So say Audit Scotland, not me, but Audit Scotland, as they do not receive core grant monies, uh, nor are they controlled by the local authority. Yet this financial sword of Damocles now hangs over them and the services they provide. 
In a letter to the Finance Secretary, these Shetland organisations made clear what will happen if rates relief is removed. A reduction in activities on Shetland's outer islands, charges by, up by at least 50%. Some facilities and leisure centres may indeed have to close. And two specific points on policy objectives that government very much make clear. The well-being work in care homes for elderly people could have to be cancelled. Uh, and if rates relief is abolished in 2018, according to the Shetland Recreational Trust, that would mean a reduction in the interventions for young people. That, ironically, in 2018 being the year of young people. So ministers, I hope, need to be properly briefed on the Islands Bill if they let this happen. Because ministers uh, cannot say on one hand we want to island-proof policy areas and the financial consequences of policy areas and yet, and yet let this happen. So I'd ask the Finance Secretary to consider making sure that what he does in his budget uh, in relation to this and indeed other areas is properly island-proofed. The government also cannot simply pass this all over to local government. They cannot, in that sense, pass the financial buck. The SIC leader is here tomorrow to meet uh, Mr Mackay on inter-island ferries. There's a £7 million black hole there. We don't want that hole to be made worse. So I hope the Cabinet Secretary will not solve his budget difficulties by simply transferring this cost to local government right across the country. I'd be grateful, indeed I'm sure Parliament would be grateful, for an assurance from him tonight that that will not happen. Across Shetland, if the government cut rates relief, funding, that funds £1.4 million pounds of expenditure, and that will have to be cut. That will cancel huge swathes of charitable work. The Shetland Recreational Trust, the Shetland Immunity Trust, uh, and Shetland Arts are vital components of Shetland's offering to its people, to visitors, to tourists, and those who we want to attract to live in the islands. I do not want those damaged. And that's the decision the Finance Secretary Faces. I urge him to take the correct decision, recognise the wider policy commitments across sport, the arts, health, and leave this rates relief in place. Otherwise, I fear that the knock-on effects on mental health and well-being in particular will be far-reaching and in some cases irreversible. Uh, thank you. Uh, call Liam Kerr to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. So, we welcome many of the proposals in the Barclay Review, but as my colleagues have outlined, we're concerned about the implications for local services if all of the recommendations are enacted. And I want to highlight the particular plight of a specific organization that demonstrates the damaging impact that these plans could have. I recently had the pleasure of visiting the Rossi Young People's Trust, which is just outside Montrose. It is an organization that provides vulnerable young people with secure care and accommodation. Now, the current system allows Rossi to reinvest the money that they save in charitable relief back into their organization to improve their services and help young people reintegrate to mainstream schooling and the community. But if integrated fully, if implemented fully, the Barclay recommendations will restrict charitable relief and force Rossi to remove frontline funding and fork out for the rates instead. Now, we can surely all agree that the purpose of charging business rates is to raise money for strong public services. So why then would this government take money from organizations like Rossi that already provide a vital service to communities and to our children? That is not right, but neither is it logical. And I think Tavish Scott made important points just there. We should be fully supporting charities like Rossi who are helping to reduce the cost to other public services which will no doubt struggle to pick up the consequences if charitable institutions are forced to reduce their offering. John Mason talks of robbing Peter to pay Paul. This would be it in action, destroying good operations like Rossi and leaving the public sector to pick up the pieces. Look, a complete overhaul of the business rate system is long overdue. But the government are choosing a sticking plaster approach and the injury will be to organizations like Rossi that are integral to local communities and vulnerable young people. So just like the proposals to introduce a swim tax on local sports clubs, any attempt to remove charitable relief would harm valued health and social services across Scotland and the SNP should comprehensively and conclusively rule it out. I think he's just concluded. Um, I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Mr Finlay, please. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. I have to say if swim tax is the best the Tories can come up with, it's getting a bit desperate. But anyway, uh, I have to say the Barclay Review proposals uh, would have very serious consequences for uh, com our communities, particularly in Edinburgh and West Lothian. In my region, 
I've never been a fan of the Alio model, but we are where we are. Um, and the reality is what has been proposed could be disastrous. The local government year on year has been a target for cuts from this government. 10 years of cuts with 327 million more this year. In an attempt to shore up statutory services and adhere to the demands of uh, government policy regarding ring fencing, uh, non-statutory services are taking a disproportionately big hit. Sport and leisure is in the front line of the cuts and major reductions in service have already been made 7.5% in the last three years, £42 million. And the Barclay Review proposals, if unchanged, will make this situation much worse with the potential of another £46 million at stake. Such a cut would be a disaster for sports centres, museums, swimming pools, community halls and the rest. And we saw from the briefings that we got, 92% of trusts said they would be forced to close facilities. Some trusts questioning whether they would be able to exist anymore. Uh, I've never been a fan of that model, but I understand why they were set up, largely to try and protect services provided in our communities. But I have to say, like all other financial sleight of hand, like PFI, like NPD, like TIF, I think they are just another financial bit of trickery. Because ultimately, there's only one pot of cash, and it's through taxation that you get that cash. And no matter how you, you manipulate that cash, ultimately it comes back to one pot. And I'm sure we'll see the repercussions of NPD and TIF in the future as well. We'll be back debating them, eh, I'm sure. As convener of the Health and Sport Committee, I'm very concerned about anything that is a barrier to uh, people participating in sport and physical activity. And reduced hours, closed facilities, staff being made redundant, increased charges, removal of subsidy, uh, all of these will reduce participation. And as is always the case, it will be the poorest, the low paid, the disabled, and the most needy who will suffer the greatest disadvantage as we see facilities close and charges rise. And all of this contrary, direct, directly contrary to the stated policy position of the government and the rhetoric that follows it. President officer, as these cuts and the 10 years of council cuts, uh, they, what they do is they remind me of the scene from the life of Brian where the cabinet secretary, despite chopping off every limb of local government that local government has, claiming, don't worry, it's just a scratch or at worst a flesh wound. Minister, local government is barely twitching. I have to say that. It's been destroyed, systematically destroyed year on year by this government. And this approach would be a near fatal blow to some of the services that people rely on in our communities. Uh, thank you. And I apologise for the clock not being switched on. You did get your four minutes, just in case somebody's wondering if people were having excessive time. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, thank you for taking me in this debate, because I know I didn't press my button at the beginning, but I, just, I was having listened to some of the contributions, I felt I just had to make some comments, and they'll be short. First of all, let me say, I, I'm a former chairman of a, one of these alleyways, Perth and Kinross Reisure and Recreation Facilities, which has now morphed into live active. I'm also acutely aware of the services in the constituency I now represent with um, and, and, and Stirling and the particular issues that will affect that, the organisations there and my own patch. Um, I, I'm delighted that Gordon Lindhurst has raised this tonight. I think it's a chance to, to explore some of the issues behind it. And I, I don't underestimate the seriousness of the, the issues that are being raised. But some of it's been raised with a, a level of invective and frankly it undermines the case that's been put forward. And, you know, I've, I've never seen... Murdo Fraser, for instance, as the champion of the Speedos. And goodness, I hope I, hope I, hope I never <laughs> live to see him in a pair. But when you start categorizing this as some, some sort of swim tax, it really devalues the argument. Because people like Andy Whiteman actually put forward a, a reasoned argument that had a sound basis, had thought through his arguments, instead of just coming forward with uh, invective that really does not help the case if we're trying to, to win over whatever um, the, the, res the result of this might be. Now, uh, 
Dean Lockhart. Uh, just in the spirit of uh, consensus, would he join me in meeting with uh, Andrew Bain, Chief Executive of Active Sterling, who I spoke to today and who expressed his um, uh, real concerns about the consequences of this change if it does go ahead? I'd be delighted if he would join me. Well, Bruce Crawford. Had I not already spoken to Andy Bain some, matter of, some time ago about these issues, then I might have been happy to have joined in with Dean Lockhart, but I've been on this case for a little while as far as the organisation and Stirling's concern. But if you want to set up that meeting, Dean, and you want me along, I'll still partake in it, because that's the sort of guy I am. Um, but, you know, there is a bit of an anomaly in all of this as well, because if you think of the public services that are currently paying um, business rates, you know, that might be hospitals, day centres, care homes, and some, in some occasions, places which are sports centres, which are not in alios, they'll all be paying business rates. So there's also a, a fair degree of hypocrisy being put forward by some elements of the argument. Now, that's not me making an argument for bringing in business rates for these organisations. I just think when we examine this and we look at it, we're going to do it on a rational basis. I think the way Andy Whiteman laid out his argument uh, it was a, a rational process. Some of the other stuff's been pretty irrational. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle, last speaker in the open debate, please, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm actually grateful to be able to make a small contribution to this debate, and can I thank my colleague Gordon Linhurst for bringing this topic uh, to the Chamber. And I think what concerns me in the Barclay Review lies within the potential unintended consequences of retracting the business rate exemptions for council alios and especially for voluntary sports club. And I think this is particularly relevant in the context of the recently launched diet and obesity consultation as well as the mental health strategy. And I do recognise the government's need to consider uh, tax raising and spend across all portfolios, but I would question whether removing uh, the business rate exemptions for these kinds of organisations would in fact raise any extra revenue. The reality is it would have the potential to force organisations and councils to rationalise services they offer and or raise the cost of, of participation. And we're trying to increase participation and reach out to those in the more challenging circumstances. And I think uh, uh, by removing these, this may move those initiatives further away from those who need it most. And Sam H state that the key to good mental health, for example, is inclusivity and activity. And if we're going to tackle obesity and, 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 and type two diabetes and musculoskeletal conditions and cardiovascular disease and many more, uh, we have to recognize that these are positively impacted when taking part in, in any kind of activity. Any reduction in these services will inevitably pass on the cost to a health service already under significant strain. So, briefly in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, in consideration of the Scottish Budget, I would ask the Scottish Government to reflect on the potential unintended consequences of withdrawing business rate exemptions from alios and voluntary uh, sports clubs, because in the Bartlett Review specifically, I think that's what is missing from it, but should certainly not be absent from any responsible uh, government considerations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I uh, call on Derek Mackay to close for the Governor, Cabinet Secretary. Seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I say I've, I've actually found this uh, debate uh, very helpful and uh, informative because I am absolutely still engaging in this subject and this parliamentary debate is, uh, is now part of that. And I suppose that is to be welcomed. Therefore, I welcome the, the debate uh, that's been uh, presented and uh, for the most part it has been constructive I think in good nature despite uh, Murdo Fraser's desire to get a headline for the second time on uh, swim tax uh, and uh, Neil Finlay um, <laughs> mixing his, uh, mixing his uh, Monty Python uh, references. But can I say what's really important about this is that we do exactly as Brian Whittle has suggested actually, which is to consider this issue in the round in terms of our health and well-being and sport objectives and culture as well, but also consider it in the context of budgetary decisions and the reality that we have to balance the books. It, some members have deliberately conflated Barclay recommendations with government opinion. Government opinion is what I present, Barclay uh, report is what the panel uh, has published and I think has largely been well received. There were some recommendations that I immediately rejected, for example, around agricultural 
land, building the infrastructure around that, but not to, not to tax. It was such... Uh, I will, yes. Andy Whiteman. Intervention. It was notable that the government rejected just two recommendations. One was to get everything onto the roll, so at least we know what its value is and what its potential cost of exemptions are. And the other was to ignore a recommendation to introduce non-domestic rates for industrial premises and food processing that just happen to be on agricultural land, when food processing and manufacturing facilities that are in industrial estates will pay. Does he not accept that that would be a better uh, area to look at in terms of raising some additional revenue than um, the proposal to um, exempt uh, to, to, to exempt alios from their charitable status. Cabinet Secretary. You no, know, it was incredibly difficult, bureaucratic, hard to define, and essentially it would create a new bureaucracy with no intention to tax and wouldn't raise the kind of values that would be required to contribute to the other areas, so it wasn't worth progressing. But what I said at the time is I thought that some elements of Barclay, such as those that we've debated this evening, um, require deeper and further thought and consideration so that I had the ability to engage with those uh, affected, and that's what me and my officials have been doing. Um, if there was a concern about lack of awareness beforehand, I think those that could be affected are certainly aware now because there is that engagement uh, in the process, the submissions, the letters and the meetings that have been uh, undertaken. And that will inform ultimately the government's um, uh, decision. I was criticised at the same time for um, not having nailed my colours to the mast, uh, but equally asked to engage, consult and consider. So I think in engaging, consulting and considering, uh, we're doing the right thing. I do propose to as I said, I would uh, say more in the budget on the 14th of December and have an implementation plan by the end of the calendar year. You'll see the proximity uh, to that. So there will be certainty, but it is right that we take time to get uh, recommendations right. Uh, having taken actions around uh, the uh, poundage, around small business bonus, uh, a, a caps for hospitality, o other areas affected by the revaluation, which is determined by the assessors. In terms of Daniel Johnston's point around the alternative to the current system, um, I think Dean Lockhart mentioned that um, as well. I've not been presented with a better alternative system in terms of non-domestic rates than the one we have right now, but the Barclay recommendations uh, were fairly well received in terms of the refinements that can be made. But a major challenge in that is how the assessors conduct their assessments and the methodology and that is a matter that will be part of the implementation plan and frankly I've never known the assessors to be so engaged with ministers and it's partly because I've had a shot across the bow in terms of their future um, operation and some of the recommendations uh, in the Barclay uh, report uh, in that um, regard. Can I make a point around tax? Yes I will. Liam Kerr. Cabinet Secretary appears to have rejected uh, a couple of the recommendations. Can you give us any idea of what the criteria or the outcomes uh, that caused him to reject them in order that uh, uh, we can bring forward ideas as to why he should reject, for example, these measures? Cabinet I, I Secretary. I had already partly addressed that uh, with Andy Whiteman's comment around it was bureaucratic. There, we were putting uh, properties on the register ultimately not to tax them because there wasn't a, a, a call to tax agricultural properties apart from those uh, commercial operations on agricultural land. It, so it wasn't, it wasn't in the interests of either finance or that sector uh, to progress with those. With these recommendations, we absolutely have to understand the consequences, and that's what the government is engaged in. Some members have complained about the revenue-neutral nature of the remit of Barclay, but it is a fact of life when you're finance sector, when you're in government, you have to balance the books. And it, you may well be hamstrung by that requirement to balance the books, but it is absolutely uh, essential, and of course there's choices within that. I thought that Tavish Scott made very important points around the island perspective. Of course, I was minister who took forward em empowering our island communities a, a agenda a, a, as, as local government minister, and then through as um, a minister for transport in the island. So I'm very familiar with, with those issues and take them seriously. Of course, any local authority can actually create any relief scheme that they uh, believe is appropriate to local circumstance. Uh, in terms of addressing 
uh, local need, but we absolutely want to capture the issues right uh, across um, Scotland. The point I wanted to make around tax avoidance it is partly true. When I was a council leader, the briefings that council leaders get and conveners of finance get in terms of uh, in-house council operations moving to trust scenarios, the briefing largely goes that you could avoid paying non-domestic rates to do this. That's not necessarily a bad thing in that those savings can be reinvested in frontline services. That may be tax avoidance by definition. It may not be a bad thing, but it is a briefing around tax avoidance and is a determining factor in creating those kind of structures that uh, Neil Finlay and others have said is maybe not what they would seek and how we structure public services. It might be quite different from an individual that hides their, um, a, 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 their income uh, to avoid paying tax, the debate between tax and uh, avoidance and, uh, and evasion. But fundamentally, this debate is helpful in that it helps inform government thinking as we fully consider the issues before us in terms of non-domestic rates, uh, the reliefs, and the support that we give uh, in terms of what is a valued part of public sector uh, infrastructure. And for that reason, I welcome the uh, contribution that members have made, and I will bear that in mind as I present uh, the budget. But members must also appreciate we must balance uh, the books, and we must take the right decisions to ensure that there is fairness and consistency within uh, the rates regime. And equally, we must draw a line uh, somewhere in terms uh, of uh, the appropriate relief. So I appreciate the engagement that I've had from across the chamber on this very important subject. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.